Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and I had one of my followers ask me, how about if you talk about biplanes? Because biplanes are different. And yes, they are. Biplanes are definitely different. And you know, when I got my biplane, my Great Lakes, you know, I realized this thing is different. Okay, well, how are they different? Well, I'm out here in the source of all knowledge. Um, this is where I keep my monoplane here. It's good to have two engines if you only have good wing. But I thought, well, heck, I'll go out to the source of all knowledge out in my toy box, the hangar, and I'll see what I can find out because I'm sure I've got some information. So, oh, by the way, I, I'm, I'm pretty sorry about this. Uh, I keep saying I'm going to clean up my hangar, okay? I'm, I'm going to do it in the winter. It's winter now. I keep saying I'm going to do it in the winter because that's when I'll have time. Well, I don't have time. It's the holidays. There's all sorts of stuff going on. My wife calls this my toy box, by the way. So uh, I'll do it in the summer. Well, in the summer, you want to fly. Okay, well, so you'll have to excuse it. This is a mess. Um, kids will have to clean it up eventually but I said oh I'll get some old I'll get some old textbooks here this is a, the one of the bookcases I got bookcases all over the place but I thought well let's look some stuff up let's get the old test pilot school books out here from the the late 70s let's see I'm sure they must have something oh that wasn't good I'm sure they must have something about uh bike planes in here because uh this is written in uh the late 70s and uh, see, April 77, that's uh, fairly close to, to Wright Brothers, almost as close uh, as we are to 77 now. But okay, uh, background, external stores, carriage, separation testing, that's ah, not going to do it. Uh, the external stores they used back then, they just took a bomb and they, they handed it out. Okay, that's not going to work. Yeah, external stores. Um, yeah, that's, that's not it. Looking for biplanes. No, well, oh, there's a Snoopy. Now that's close. Uh, human factors. Okay, that's human factors. Uh, we all know Snoopy flew biplanes. Uh, famous World War um, One ace. There he is. Okay, well, no. He's not talking about biplanes. Well, let's look some more. Oh, electronics. Well, no, they didn't really have electronics back then when the Wright brothers were flying. Look at these. NPN, PNP transistors. Uh, yeah. Okay, and they're all talking about how they they work. Yep. Okay, well, that's not going to help me. Okay. Electro-optical systems? No. Nah, that's not going to do it. Well, I don't know. This is this is discouraging. Uh, that's no good. No. Nope. Okay, well, let's try another one here. I got three books here. This is one. Okay, let's get the other books out here. Let's find another one, see if it's any better. I'm just going to set this one up here for a minute. That fell out of the... Okay, performance. Well, that's good, because we all know biplanes perform. Okay, and they perform pretty well, too. they got a lot of lift. Okay, uh, National Technical Information Service. Uh, okay, this is written in 73, performance. Well, it's got an F-15 on it. Uh, that had a lot of performance. Oh, Joe Guthrie, he was a he was a super cool guy. Um, I wore a cowboy hat when he <laughs> when he walked out to the airplane. Really cool guy. Now I'm not seeing any biplanes here. Oh, they're talking about supersonic flight. Oh, mock cone. No, you didn't get any mock cones off the uh, the Wright brothers, and I don't get any. Nope, oh, that's a spacecraft. Uh, kind of primitive, <laughs> but that's yeah. Okay, not finding anything here. Airspeed indicator. Well, that's cool. Equivalent airspeed. Yeah, I'm not sure if it matters all that much. We're, we're not dealing with compressibility or anything. Yeah, more equations. Lift. Well, that's good. It's lift. We're talking about lift. No, that's not going to do it either. All right. Well, I got one last book here. Let's look at one last book. Okay. We'll take a look at that. What's the last one? Stability and control. Okay. Well, maybe that's it. Maybe that's what we're looking for. All right. We'll look at this one here. Okay, stability and control. Uh, no, no, I don't know. Let's take a look here. Uh, variable stability demonstration program. Oh, that's the old Cal Spencer. Longitudinal static stability. Okay, this is good. Uh, that's not a biplane. Dynamic stability, that's always good. Highlighted stuff, must have been important. Okay. Uh, oh, T-38, good airplane, but uh, no. No, no biplanes. No, no, that's definitely not a biplane. Okay, that's a, that's not a biplane. 
Uh, we're not having much luck here. All right. Well, we're going to have to look elsewhere. I got books at home. That was not very fruitful. Okay, we're going to have to go and look at books at home. Well, all right. That's the next adventure. We'll leave the great toy box in the sky here, and we'll go see what we can find at home. Well, let's take a break from the great pub search, because... I didn't have a lot of luck initially finding a lot of information. You know, this is just an airplane that isn't used except for a little uh, niche group of people who like aerobatics and like old airplanes. So, what the heck. Uh, let's just go up and fly because that's a fun thing. And you know, you don't necessarily, if you got a lot of piloting experience, you don't necessarily have to understand everything about an airplane just to go up and fly it. You'll, you'll figure it out pretty quick. And one of the things you figure out is this airplane has a lot of drag. Um, it doesn't have flaps. It really doesn't need flaps. I've had to do very little slipping in it because it just comes out of the sky very nicely. And I can fly nice, tight, idle patterns in the airplane. And these airplanes, uh, tail draggers, conventional gear airplanes, they are just made for grass strips. Uh, because uh, you know, if you get a little bit of side loads or stuff like that... Um, you know, it, it slips around a little bit. The concrete tends to grab the tires, and uh, the grass can be a little softer too. Although, uh, you know, if you got a good airfield that's been there for a long time, it's it's nice and firm. But you know, there's a lot to know about this old design. Um, it's very interesting. Like, you know, the Wright brothers started out with it. You know, uh, that must not have been too bad. Well, why did they? Well, most of it is for structural strength. You can make a box structure like this. And you, you, you don't have as beefy of spars or as much weight as a cantilever wing. So you can get away with a lot lighter materials. And you have bracing wires on the inside of the wings that are they're covered up here in this example. You have drag wires, anti-drag wires. And then, of course, you've got uh, on this airplane, you've got the intern external uh, structure. Uh, you've got uh, the uh, inner plane struts. You've got the uh, the bracing uh, between the upper wing and the fuselage there. And now you notice, um, of course, you've got stagger. Now, why do you stagger the wings? Well, there's a very good reason to do that because the low pressure on the top of the bottom wing and the high pressure on the bottom of the top wing interfere with each other and they reduce lift. So uh, if you just have the wings... Uh, position directly one on top of the other, you lose about 10 to 15 percent of lift because of that interference. So what they do is they stagger them. And if you move uh, the upper wing forward, that's called a positive stagger. Okay, uh, there are some airplanes that the upper wing is moved back, and I'm going to point those out, and you, you know, you probably know what they are anyway. But like I said, this is just a fun airplane to fly, and you can have a lot of fun flying, even if, you know, you don't have all the concepts down. Uh, but there's there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of history on these airplanes. And, you know, just flying an open cockpit airplane is just a lot of fun. But, okay, uh, we're going to complete the, uh, the search here for documentation. And then I'm going to lay it all out with a bunch of examples. So just hang in there. We'll get to it here shortly. Uh, thanks for watching. And we'll have this all nicely uh, laid out for you. All right, so the search continues. I've got to find some information on biplanes. Well, I got a lot of books out of my library and I laid them out here. Well, let's take a look. Well, that's way too modern. That's not going to do. Well, that's a fun story about, um, you know, Richard Bach flying his biplane around. He gets into some nasty weather. About a guy who flies a steerman all over the place, he, uh, all over the U.S. He doesn't talk about he doesn't talk about the design. Oh, modern airmanship! I bet that does it. Uh, no, it's written in '57. Yeah, that's uh, well, that's a little too modern. Yeah, that's not going to do it. Way too modern. Aircraft performance, that's nah, too modern. Avro, well, they did a lot of stuff. They they did a lot of biplane stuff. That's kind of cool. Um, and, well, a lot of more advanced stuff. Um, that was a good book. I, I got that, uh, actually, from the very aerospace people when I went over to do a, a flight evaluation on the BAE-146. That was kind of cool. They gave me some history. This is good. A guy restores an old uh, Waco, flies it around. That's kind of neat. But they're not talking about biplanes. Ah, 
Black Cats and Outside Loops, Tex Rankin. He was a cool guy flying, uh, flying the Great Lakes. Knights of the Year. Well, they used it in, you know, they used it in World War I, um, flew around. You know, these airplanes, uh, the engines had castor oil in them, and it would spray back on the pilots. You know what happens when you ingest a lot of castor oil? Yeah, this isn't quite the uh, the lore of the fighter pilot that you want. No, no, not at all. Ah, this is my graduate uh, level aerodynamics course, flight dynamics of rigid and elastic airplanes. Ah, this book. Oh, this is an expensive one. This is twenty five bucks. Yeah, lots of equations. Now highlighted some stuff. Must have been important. Oh, they like matrices. This is not doing it. This is still not doing it. Yeah. Too many high-speed airplanes. That's definitely not a biplane. Ah, but I finally found it. This book, Monoplanes and Biplanes, Their Design and Construction Operation. Grover Cleveland Loring. This book was written in 1910. Now, you, you think that's probably pretty early. That's seven years after the Wright brothers flew. But you know, surprisingly, they really were pretty advanced. They had a lot of graphs, charts. They, they had done a lot of research. They really knew what they were doing. And I had to go this far back, okay? We're talking about over 110 years back to find out anything that really talks about biplanes. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about it is, is a lot of these airplanes back then, um, <laughs> This was before they really figured out how they wanted to do things. And there was a lack of standardization. The way you controlled the elevator in one airplane, the rudder in another, and the ailerons could be totally different. You could have totally different controls, wheels, sticks. You moved your body back and forth. Man, you talk about, you know, guys talking about how hard it is to go from a, you know, a 172 to a 152, you know? That was nothing compared to what these guys put up. But anyway. There's a lot of neat things about biplanes, and I got a lot of information now, and I'm going to discuss that with examples. Stay tuned. All right, so this is the Boeing Stearman Model 75 PT-13D. This uh, was built in Wichita. I used to live in Wichita, but uh, this was before my time. But this was used as trainer for pilots in World War II. And for most people, this is a biplane. You see it's got the standard two wings. Well, what is a biplane? That's a definition of a biplane. It's, it's a fixed wing aircraft with two main wings stacked uh, one on top above the other. And the first biplane to fly, of course, we all know was the Wright brothers. Now, what's the advantage of the biplane? Well, well, the biplane has a structural advantage over the monoplane, but it produces more drag than a monoplane wing. And improved structural techniques came along, and the biplane as, as a frontline type of airplane was pretty much made obsolete uh, by the 1930s. Now, now here is the aircraft used in the movie The Great Waldo Pepper. And this was a very basic aircraft, a very early biplane at the time. And they didn't understand the interference drag between the upper wing and the lower wing. And like I mentioned earlier, because the interference drag, you don't get the lift that you would with the same wing area of a, uh, a monowing airplane. You get a reduction in efficiency. And they typically say, I, I've heard various figures, but they say that a typical biplane will get 70% of the efficiency that a monowing airplane would have. So here, there is no stagger. Well, most of the stagger you have is positive stagger where you move the upper wing forward. And by moving the upper wing forward, um, you get away from the two wings interfering with each other as much and you you reduce that interference drag now biplanes have a lot of drag which which is nice they come they come down nicely uh, they have a lot of drag a lot of lift you can turn nicely uh, but by putting the two wings directly over each other you uh, you kind of negate the uh, the effect of the the lift from both wings so they're losing 10 to 15 percent here so you want stagger either forward or back and i'll show you an example of the back stagger most of the stagger on uh, these type of airplanes 
um, the biplanes are forward stagger. Well, this is a Gloucester Gladiator, and although I mentioned biplanes pretty much became obsolete by the 30s, uh, we and other countries, other allies, actually entered World War II with biplanes. And one of the uh, advantages, if you will, of war is rapid technological advancement. And as you can see, the, the biplanes uh, became history as far as warfare very quickly. So here we have the Beach Stagger Wing, probably one of the most beautiful biplanes ever built. And because of the configuration of the, the cabin there, they move the upper wing aft to give the pilot better visibility. You get the advantage either way. Now this is a Russian design, the Polikarfov PO2. Um, there are about 20,000 of these built by the Russians. And you notice the wings. They have the same area, the upper and the lower wing, which um, is not as common as you might think. It, it's, it's often that the wings will have different uh, area. And there's actually a, a specialized name for this. Now, this is the Newport 17, and as you might notice, the lower wing has a smaller cord, but a very similar span than the upper wing, and this is called a sesquiplane now, design. Now, next time you're at a cocktail party with uh, some young lady next to you, you might say, you know, I, th I think the sesquiplane design of biplanes is much superior. And um, the reason is, uh, basically, and, and that's from the Latin word, sesquiplane means uh, one and a half wings. Uh, this arrangement can reduce drag and weight while retaining the biplane's structural advantages. The lower wing may have a significantly shorter span and reduced cord. I'm, sh I'm sure that will totally impress her. Now, this, this aircraft uh, saw service between 1915 and 1917, and the Germans, after they shot a few of these down, were very impressed with the design, and uh, they ended up uh, copying it, uh, obviously, to use on their aircraft during World War I. All right. Well, this biplane is a 1930s Fiat CR42, uh, Falco, and uh, it's got what's known as Warren truss. And uh, what these are are um, very substantial truss that you use for bracing the upper and lower wing. And you don't have to worry about the uh, flying and landing wires and the rigging, which uh, can take a, a fair amount of extensive work because usually there's a fair variation in the uh, tension on the rigging wires and you have to adjust them to get the airplane basically to fry, fly right. So if you just have a bunch of solid struts you put on there, you don't have to worry about that aspect of rigging. And just for fun, I'm going to throw this in here. This is a 1909 Voyasen biplane, and it's got curtains between the upper and lower wings, and also they kind of did that back in the tail area there. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, this is a design that really didn't catch on. Well, this is a Hadley Page V-1500 four-bay or multi-bay biplane. As you made the biplanes bigger and bigger, in this case a bomber to hold uh, more bombs, you had to have more bracing between the upper and the lower wing. And those vertical uh, struts you see there are called bays. So as the wing would go out farther and farther, you needed more and more bays, as, as you can imagine, just looking at the thing uh, for structural integrity. Now, this is a SPAD, and you notice the um, auxiliary, or what they call auxiliary struts there. Um, later, they used an N-type strut, and I have that on my Great Lakes, and a lot of the airplanes have, and that just gives you a lot more rigidity and strength of structure. Now, this is a Newport 23 with a, a single bay sesquiplane. And you notice here that they use a V structure. It's, it's kind of interesting to notice all the different things that various manufacturers tried over the years. Now, this is probably the biplane to end all biplanes. This is a Soviet Antonov. AN2, and it's from the 1940s. And you notice, like I said, most of the times the bottom wing connects to the fuselage and the upper wing there is floated and connected by cabane struts, etc. This actually is connected at both ends with one massive uh, I-beam structure there, as you can see. Now, I was at an Airline Pilots Association symposium, and we had a guest Russian pilot come and talk to us. And he was actually a, ca a captain on the AN-174, but he had a picture of one of these AN-2s. But it wasn't this nice. It was out, you know, in a field. Weeds were growing up. Pieces were dangling all over it, and it just looked terrible. And he put this slide up, and he said, this was his airplane. 
the room was totally silent because we had heard rumors about Russian airliners and stuff like that. He turned and he looked at us and he said, it's a joke. And then he had a picture of his real airplane. And here we go. This is Snoopy's airplane, the World War I Sopwith Camel. And I want to talk just a little bit about rigging because you can see the rigging wires in there. And since uh, biplanes don't have cantilever structures, they require rigging wires to maintain the rig rigidity. You just brace the whole thing and keep it tight. Now, early aircraft used just simple wire, either braided or plain. And during the First World War, the British uh, Royal Aircraft Factory actually developed airfoil section wires. And that's, uh, you know, the wires you see now, because it's much better to have an airfoil section to reduce drag. And it actually also does increase strength. Um, there were four types of wires that are used in biplane wing structures. You have the drag wires inside the wings to prevent the wings from being folded back against the fuselage, uh, running inside a wing bay from the forward inboard corner to the rear outboard corner. You also have anti-drag wires that prevent the wings from moving forward when the aircraft stop, and they run in the opposite uh, direction to the drag wires. Uh, both of these are usually hidden in the wing structure because it's covered over, and um, I've got that in, in my wing structure, and I saw that as it was being built. Um, if the structure is sufficiently strong, you can actually omit that, but uh, one of the advantages of biplane is you can make a, a light structure. Now, they also have external uh, lift wires to prevent the wings from folding up, and they run the underside of the outer wing to the lower wing root, and conversely, you have landing wires that prevent the wings from sagging and resist the force when an airplane is landing. And they run from the upper wing center to the outboard and lower wings. Now, you can use additional drag and anti-drag wires uh, to brace the uh, cabane struts. Those are back there on the, on the center, uh, attaching the uh, fuselage to the wing. And um, uh, you can use interplane struts, which also connect the upper and the lower wings together. Now, this is a fleet finch primary trainer, and you can see the wing stagger on it and also the end strut. It's, of course, very visible in the black paint here. Now, this is my Great Lakes, and you can also see the end strut out there. It's kind of at the edge of the picture. That's my son up there uh, next to the cockpit. And you notice the upper wing actually uh, has some sweet back and you're going well is that for high speed mock characteristics no no it's not um, for the shock waves and that no uh, they actually found that if the wings were both straight uh, it had not the best spin characteristics and this is uh, a very aerobatic aircraft and you want a good spin characteristics now, here we are up at Oshkosh a few years ago at the Waco booth, and you can see my uh, biplane there actually in the distance uh, and 727KR and one of the Waco YMFs in the foreground. You notice there really isn't the uh, sweep back on the upper wing there. Apparently, it wasn't necessary in the design. Now, the Great Lakes used to be the aerobatic aircraft until the pits come along, and I can't end this presentation without talking about the absolutely beautifully designed and fun-to-fly pits aircraft, um, one, of the, one of the greatest biplanes of all time. So, I hope you enjoyed that. There is an endless number of biplanes that uh, we can talk about, but I hope I covered the major design, uh, flight considerations, characteristics, and the various things that go into biplane uh, design and operation. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.